Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Mandarin Baptist Church. Once again, we have gathered to worship the Lord in this season when we remember his birth. We are now coming into the second week, and uh, we have a wonderful message prepared today. We're in the Messianic Psalms, and uh, looking at the 22nd Psalm, uh, great uh, psalm with, with many prophetic um, uh, messages regarding our Savior. Now let's prepare our hearts as we come to worship uh, in prayer. Heavenly Father, how good it is to be gathered together, whether here within the church or at home, through the internet, we are all gathered together to worship you. We thank you, Father, for your indescribable, your wonderful gift of salvation that you have brought to us. And in this season, we lift our hearts in joy at the thought that you loved us so much while we were sinners that you sent your only begotten Son, to be our sacrifice, to pay for our sins, to make us right with you. We thank you, Father, for the privilege of worship as has been done for thousands of years by your church, by your people of Israel before Christ came to earth. Father, we come to worship you in your holy place. And we are thankful that uh, our church is a place of gathering, but we're most thankful and grateful that Christ has made residence in our hearts through the Holy Spirit, so that you are with us always. You hear our prayers always, and you know our every need. We know that you are there to meet our needs, not our wants, but our needs in Christ Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. So I hope everybody has had a good week. Uh, I don't know yet whether it feels like the Christmas season. We're, we're kind of easing our way into it. Uh, of course, it's a difficult time right now uh, because of the coronavirus upswing and and the uh, restrictions that are being made from our, uh, our governing authorities. But nevertheless, we are entering into the Christmas season. It felt a little bit like it today, didn't it? A little cooler, the cold wind, it seems like Christmas is coming. So uh, let's, uh, let's rejoice in our hearts as we come before the Lord and bring him praise in song. Michael? Good morning, everyone. It's uh, nice to see you all. Let me switch the mic here. Uh, we would like to start today with a quiz. Okay, so I'd like to see who pays attention to Pastor Danny's sermon. All right, so this is from last Sunday. Should be easy, should be easy. <laughs> So, uh, so, 
Oh, man, we gave up already. All right, all right, all right. But we still need to do it, all right. So last Sunday, Pastor Danny mentioned about his grandmother, and she has this old record player, right? And she loves to play this song. And that song turns out to be one of Pastor Danny's favorite songs. Anybody know what's the title of the song? <laughs> Who put it on the screen? <laughs> all right, all right. Good job, everybody. Um, so see, Pastor Danny, we do pay attention to what you say <laughs> with some help. <laughs> Good job, everybody. So you all got it right. You can all take the rest of the day off. <laughs> all right, why don't we all stand and sing this song together? There's something about the name. Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name. Master, Savior, Jesus, like a fragrance after the rain. Jesus, 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 let all heaven and earth proclaim. Kings and kingdoms, they all pass away, but something about that day. Jesus, name above all. something so special about your name. Your name is so powerful, but at the same time, it is so comforting. So when, when we might feel that it's hopeless, and when we might have this fear 
in our hearts. When there's no place to turn to, Lord, we can just call on your name. And then you'll bless us with this peace and joy in our hearts. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for this wonderful blessing. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Yeah, Christmas is just around the corner, right? So uh, if we look around the world, we might think that uh, it's, a, it's a strange Christmas. Or we might feel like it's a doomed Christmas, right? Uh, but you know what? I want to present this to you. I would like to quote Pastor Danny. Pastor Danny said, a perfect Christmas is Jesus in your heart. That's right. So as believers, if we truly understand the true meaning of Jesus is that Jesus came to this world. He was born for us, right? And then we'll have this joy, this hope in our hearts. No matter what the outside situation is, nothing can take the joy from our heart. So with the Spirit, let's have, let's sing a Joyful Christmas song. It's Christmas. It's Christmas. The angels are singing. And I know the reason. The Savior is born. It's Christmas, the bells are ringing, and I feel like shouting, joy to the world. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Silent fox by night Behold throughout the heavens The show of the holy light Go tell it on the mountain Over the hills and everywhere Go tell it on the mountain That Jesus Christ is born Tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go, tell it on the mountain, that Jesus Christ is born. Now in a lonely manger, the humble Christ was born. And God sent us salvation, that blessed the Christmas I know the reason the Savior is born. It's Christmas, the bells are ringing, and I feel like shouting a joy to the world. It's Christmas, the angels are singing. I know the reason the Savior is born. It's Christmas, the bells are ringing, and I feel like shouting, a joy to the world, a 
joy to the world. Oh, joy to the world. <laughs> wow, thank you, Annie, for the final touch. Ding. Merry Christmas, everyone. Amen. Let's uh, bow our heads and pray for the offering. Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you have provided for us through giving us work and other resources so that we can give to others and that we can give back to you. We pray, Father, for the offering that was given and we ask that you use it and multiply it. Glorify yourself with the work that is, um, that is uh, made available through the funds that we give. We thank you, Father, that uh, you have given this to us as a privilege to be able to give to you and to your work. We know that you are the God who owns the cattle on a thousand hills, and you don't really need our money. And yet, you give us the opportunity to give to you and to worship you. It's an act of worship to give of our resources back to you and to help others. We thank you for that honor, and we pray that you bless it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Uh, we have just a few announcements. Uh, first of all, probably uh, most important because of uh, the date approaching us so quickly uh, is the vote ballots that you should have received by mail. Uh, and due to the pandemic, a ballot was mailed to all the members. Normally, we have a gathering where we vote on the budget for the upcoming year. Uh, but because of uh, coronavirus, we're not able to do that. So we ask that if you have not sent in your ballot, please get it in, a, in the mail immediately. Uh, as December 19th is the date when the votes will be counted. It's not only, by the way, about the budget this year, but also uh, about the, uh, 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 yeah, uh, Pas Pastor Daudi. Well, I keep saying pastor. It's not quite. It's Minister Daudi. But we are also voting uh, for as regards to his ordina ordination. So please do get that in if you have not mailed it already. Also, uh, Global Conference of the Chinese Mission Convention is this December 28th through 30th. Uh, now in the past, uh, it hasn't been something that's been uh, shown online. Uh, for those of us who've been available to do so, we've been able to go and participate in the mission. Um, at the CMO, uh, but this year it's going to be online, so we really have no excuse for not uh, tuning in. Uh, in order to participate in this, by the way, it only costs $25. You can pay online. Uh, Pastor Danny has sent out an email with a link that you can go to uh, in order to, to join. Uh, speakers will be David Platt, Francis Chan, Wayne Chen and Christopher Yuan, and I'm sure there's going to be a, a number of others. Uh, also, RSVP, once again, reminder for church services. Go to mbc.org is the website. Uh, click on the banner at the top of each page and uh, do sign up. Uh, kids devotionals, children's Sunday school and adult Sunday school, uh, the information and the links uh, to participating online through Zoom uh, are also located on our uh, website. And finally, pray for our nation. We, it's still, the, the vote is not over. It's still in ter turmoil. Um, we've got the upcoming vote in Georgia. We need to be praying as the outcome of that uh, election will determine who is in control of the Senate. And I think it's very important that we be in prayer so pray for America to turn our hearts back to God and pray for God's will to be done and for an awakening 
in the church, not only in our church, but through the, for the church throughout the world. And with that, let's, uh, we're going to hear the word from Pastor Danny. Got to keep my six feet. Thank you, Mark. Do you want this, Mark? Do you want this? Uh, oh, yeah. The man? Yeah. Don't, don't uh, touch that. Yeah. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Is this on? Can you hear me? Always one in the crowd. Always. Well, it's good to see everyone here. Um, man, what a year it has been, right? Crazy year. But I, I, want, I want to talk to you today about sunrises. How many of you like the sunrise? You like, man, the sunrise. I just love the sunrise. What's the best sunrise? Is it coming over the mountain or is it coming up over the horizon and the ocean? If you're from the East Coast, you have to say it's when it comes up over the water, right? Uh, you, it, on the West Coast, I don't know where you could see that. Um, you, you, you see the sunset, uh, but you don't see the sunrise over the water. Now, in Florida, we get both, okay, because of the Atlantic and the Gulf. We, we have the luxury of both. What we don't have in Florida are mountains. Well, except for two. We have two mountains. You know that, right? Yeah. At Disney, we have Space Mountain and Thunder Mountain. Okay? Sunrise. Probably the most anticipated hour of the day. And I'll just have downloaded some pictures here that I want you to see. That's a, that's a NASA sunrise. Not many people get to see that one. Isn't that beautiful? Look at that. That is New Smyrna Beach. That's where your pastor, when he was in high school, uh, went to pray and seek the Lord. That, again, it's just beautiful, right? The sun rises. It's the most, I think, anticipated hour of the day. And I think even the most not so early risers, which we probably have some in this, uh, in this crowd, that we can all agree, though, that a new day brings a sense of renewed hope, a fresh start, a sense of optimism, the scent of the morning, the fresh morning dew, the birds echoing their early ritual. The sun peeking over the mountains and the splendor of the light cascading through the openings in the trees. You anticipate a new beginning. It's, it's a new day. It's a, it's a new chapter. As Cat Stevens used to sing, Morning has broken like the first morning. You remember that song? I am dating myself, I know. <laughs> Psalm 22, written by David, it was set to the music of the doe of the dawn. It's a psalm meant to inspire its readers to have a, a renewed sense of hope and optimism. It's a psalm depicting Yahweh as the deliverer. But when you go to read it, the opening scene is anything but that. In fact, it's the exact opposite. Perhaps the worst nightmare any human being can encounter is the total absence of God. When tragedy strikes... We often ask ourselves, where is God? Or why won't He answer? All the praying, all the crying out, day and night, and yet, silence. Where is God? It is often said that the darkest hour in the day is just before dawn. And this is where Psalm 22 opens. 
Take a look with me in verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Maybe you've been in that place. Maybe you've cried out in a desperate need for deliverance, healing. You needed to be rescued. And yet the silent response from God was deafening. I remember about five years ago, uh, it was my, my daughter came to visit for Christmas. Um, and if my daughter is watching, I, I, I just want to reiterate that. It's been five years since you visited me at Christmas. Did I tell you it's been five years? Five years. Now, our granddaughters, Emma and Maggie, I was uh, tasked with staying at home and babysitting them while Biba, Grandma, Biba and Mom went to the grocery store. And uh, when they were coming back, they, uh, they called me and they said, hey, can you open the gate because we're coming in with groceries. I, so I, I told the girls, they were watching TV in the living room, I said, girls, Pipa's going to go let Mom and, and Biba in with the groceries, and so I'll be right back. They said, okay. They responded. I mean, they were glued to the TV, but they responded. So I was gone, I don't know, maybe two, three, maybe five minutes at the most. And I came back in to uh, open the front door, and they were screaming. They said, Pipa, where did you go? We, we couldn't find you. We didn't know. We thought you left us, and you weren't here. I mean, they were just they were just hysterical. Now, mind you, the whole time, they were totally upset. They were still glued to the TV. <laughs> they thought that the grandpa abandoned them and left them all alone in a city that they weren't familiar with. We feel that way sometimes. We feel that insecurity. We sense that insecurity when we don't see God working. David is not accusing God here of wrongdoing. We need to get that straight. We need to make sure of that. But he is asking in an inquisitive way. He's asking, why? Why have you forsaken me? Notice here that the sufferer has a personal relationship with God. He says, my God. My God. He knows how faithful God has been in the past. He knows that He has come through time and time again in the lives of the people of Israel. He's not asking, how could you let this happen? That's not what he is asking. Instead, the word used here for why is an inquisitive why. And it could be translated, what is the reason? What's the purpose for this? Well, We should never accuse God of wrongdoing. It's appropriate. And it's okay to ask God inquisitively. This Tuesday, I was on my way um, here for a... uh, um, Well, actually, I was here for the prayer group. And I, I feel sorry for the prayer group because the last two weeks that we've met... I've disappeared in the middle of prayer. And, uh, you know, uh, what, just, just disappear. And they're like, whoa, you know, where's the pastor? Um, but last Tuesday, I got a, a, a call from, I, I, most of you know that I'm a, a chaplain for the Ventura County Sheriff's Department. And I got a call of a, a suicide. 14-year-old girl committed suicide. As I walked into their apartment, the 
the mom is asking why. There are questions that we just can't answer. There are times that we just don't have the answer. And God seems silent. David is asking, what's the reason for you not answering? What is the purpose? Verse 1 and continuing there. Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. In his suffering, there seems to be no answer forthcoming. There's no rescue effort being mounted. He doesn't believe that he, his groaning is ever reaching God. And in his abandonment, the psalmist, he keeps bringing his prayer before God by day and by night. Even if God is not answering, even if he is silent, David keeps bringing his prayer by day and by night. Seems like a one-way conversation. You can hear the despair in his word. He is, he's puzzled that God is seemingly nowhere to be found. He's confused because that seems so out of character with God. At the time of writing this psalm, it, it would have been roughly about 400 years since Moses recorded the promise in Deuteronomy 36.1. And it says, Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them. For it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. David was familiar with this passage that God promises to never leave and to never forsake His people. He also had many testimonies, his own account, where God was faithful to him. A question for you is, what would you do? Or what should we do when it seemed God is far? He's far from us and he doesn't hear our cry. And in our darkest hour, he seems silent. What should we do? Here's what David did. He remembered God's faithfulness in the past. Look in verse 3. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. Enthroned meaning dwell. God dwells in the praises of His people. In uh, in, In you our fathers trusted. David is recounting his ancestors, the people that came before him, and how they trusted in the Father. And you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. There are scores of history in David's ancestry where God was faithful. God rescued. So he acknowledges First of all, God's holiness. You are holy, he says. And then, he recalls God's faithfulness in the past. David grew up hearing these stories. You know, parents, when you, when you talk to your children, you ought to talk about God's faithfulness. How God was faithful to you personally. How God was faithful to your family. How God was faithful to your father and your mother. You ought to talk about every chance you get to talk about God's faithfulness. You ought to tell your children about that. Because there will come a time in their lives when they will need God. And God may seem silent and they need to draw from somewhere. And that testimony of God's faithfulness in the past could be just the thing that gets him through. So what should we do when God seems silent? 
just by remembering who He is and what He has done in the past. It gives us that glimmer of hope. That hope that is like the only thing that will get us through. But that's all we need. It's like a smoldering wick. You know what I'm talking about? It's a, it's a wick and a lamp or a, a, a candle. It's dim, but it's still lit. And as long as there is light, there is hope. He describes his condition now in verse 6 and following. It, it's, 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 a, it's a sort of an imagery, right? He says in verse, 20, uh, in verse 6, he says, But I am a worm and not a human. Now, I, I did a little study on this, the word worm, and there are two different words that you could use for worm. And I'm not going to get into the details of it, but one just simply means worm, and the other is a specific worm. And it's a, and it's a worm that they used to crush. And they would take the, the, the substance from the crushing of that worm, and that's what they would use to dye their material crimson or scarlet. It's amazing, but we'll get into that later, okay? But for the imagery here, most people would say that they could go through anything, just about anything, not that we would welcome it, not that we would want that, but we would be willing to go through anything as long as we knew that God was present, that God was with us. But in David's case here, he was not only despised by his own people, but he felt abandoned by God. The worm is a symbol of extreme weakness and helplessness. You know that saying, the early bird gets the worm? Right? It's like, we, we talk about that in the sense that, you know, it, it's good for the bird, but no one it, it cares about the worm. <laughs> right? The worm gets no respect. A worm is naturally despised and is trampled on. No one really cares about the plight of the worm. And David uses this phrase for sort of heightened poetic effect. He, he is expressing his feeling of being less than human. He feels like no one cares. David's sense of human dignity is lost. When it seems that people have rejected him and God has abandoned him. Puts him in a state where he feels less than human. So you have this perfect storm. You know, we, we could... If we knew that God was with us, it wouldn't matter if everybody else was against us. We don't want to live that way. But we would be willing to go through that as long as God was with us. But knowing that no one is for us and God is absent. That's a perfect storm. So he says, but I am a worm and not a man. Scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make uh, mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him. For he delights in him. Kind of a picture of the cross, isn't it? When he hung on the cross and they said, let him deliver himself. Let him rescue himself. Let him come down from there on his own. 
I think we can detect a little comparison here. I think in verse 3, the praises of Israel, and those same people are mocking, despising David for his trust in the Lord. Here's a question for you. Have you been mocked for your faith in God? Has that ever happened to you? Maybe not to the level of David. But have you ever been mocked? When it happens, you want God to do something. Right? Like, God, you know, you're the creator of lightning. It sure would be good if one hit by, about right now. Right about where that guy's standing. At least you want to know if God is with you. He may not do anything, but at least you want to know if God is there with you. But David has no sense that God is there. And that's why he's crying out. So to summarize that thus far, David is saying, where is God? Where are you, God? Then he tells him, you are holy and, and you can be trusted. Then he goes and, and focuses on himself. He says, I feel so low that I don't even feel human. And then the narrative shifts again back to refocus on God. You get this picture. He focuses on God and then himself and then on God again. And in verse 3, it was about God's faithfulness to His people in general. And we do that too. We say, you know, God is faithful. God's been faithful to the church. God's been faithful to His people. God's been faithful to our nation. Right? But now David makes it personal. It's not just in general, but personal account. Verse 9, yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breast. On you was I cast from my birth. And from my mother's womb, you have been my God. When you focus, this is what David did, when he focused on his condition. He concluded that he's less than human. But when he focused on God, he is reminded that he belongs to God. Listen. In your darkest hour, even when God seems silent, you can know that you belong to God. And that is a glimmer of hope. God is the one who gave him life and, and he learned to trust him at an early age. He was dedicated to God. God's been with him before he was born. In Psalm 139, I don't know exactly when it was written, but I think it was written about the same time that Psalm 22 was written, maybe a year or two uh, prior. But I want to read Psalm 139, verses 13 and 14 to you. David said this, For you formed my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. Praise you, for I am fearfully, that means awesomely, and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. I love that phrase. My soul knows it very well. Something that you and I, when, when you encounter it over and over and over again, it's like, man, it just, it's deep in your soul. 
I remember my grandma, you know, if, you, if you're from the South, okay, when you say tea, it's just, it's sweet tea, okay? I mean, when I first moved here and I'd go to a restaurant and I, I would say, do you have, do you have tea? And, and that's yes. And I, is it sweet? It's like, what? You know, it's like, you can put sugar in it if you want this. No, I want it to come sweet, you know. And my, my grandma used to make the best sweet tea. And she made this huge pitcher. And there, if you go to her house, there was always sweet tea. Ice cold in the fridge, sweet tea. She got older. It got sweeter and sweeter <laughs> and sweeter and sweeter. But I'll tell you something. There was not a time when I went to her house where I didn't have a glass of sweet tea. It just was, it was just, you just knew. You just knew that she was going to have sweet tea in her fridge. And I was never disappointed. It was repetition. I could count on her. And it's the same way with faith in God that we, we encounter God's faithfulness. The problem is not that, that we don't encounter God's faithfulness. The problem is we fail to acknowledge God's faithfulness. Well, what do you mean, Pastor? Well, you woke up this morning. There was air for you to breathe. Who do you think makes that happen? Did you make that happen? Your neighbors make that happen? Did our governor make that happen? No. God made that happen. That's some sweet tea right there. What can we learn from this? When you're blinded by the mountain that you face. And we all face mountains, okay? Some mountains are larger than others, but we all face mountains. Either health, relationship, job-related, finances. We all face mountains. And there are times in all of our lives where we feel all alone in the valley. What we can learn from this is for us to remember God's faithfulness in the past. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it well. This is not a casual relationship, folks. My soul knows it well. If you could sum up Psalm 139 into one phrase, it would be this. You know what it is? God knows me. God knows me. It's one thing for you to know God, but it's another thing for God to know you. You know, it's like we live in a, in a community of celebrities, right? Now, I, I have a hard time spotting them. I, I never can spot them, but there are people I know that's like, you know who that was? I'm like, no. You know, and they go, well, that was so-and-so. And I go, no, it can't be. So I go walking back in there, and I stare them, you know, up and down, and I come back out, and I go, no, it's not that. <laughs> and then the next thing you know, there's 10 or 15 paparazzis, oh, you know, just, you know. Well, I'll be. It was them. <laughs> but, you know, I'll tell you this. Uh, my brush with fame. I went to uh, a uh, premiere uh, showing of uh, the movie Dreamgirls. All-star cast. And uh, I'm a, a, a big fan of uh, uh, Jennifer Hudson's, uh, her music. 
And lo and behold, she, you know, she also acted, and she, I think she won an Oscar uh, in, this, in this movie. And uh, so after the show, um, she walked by, and, and, and she spoke. Now, she didn't speak to me. She was speaking to her agent. But the point is, I knew her. She had no idea who I was. Well, get this. You know God. God knows you. It's a personal relationship that you have. Do you have that kind of relationship with God? Do you realize that you were awesomely and wonderfully made in His image? That God has a purpose for your life. Notice when you focus, when David focused on that, notice how his view has changed already. Before he felt God had totally abandoned him, but now in verse 11, it says, be not far from me. That's a change. He's not saying, where are you, God? He's saying, God, I know you're there. Just don't be far. Stay close to me, Lord. Don't go too far. Trouble is near. There's none to help me. Don't be too far, God. But he no longer feels that God is absent. Just remembering what God did to him and for him in the past, he's come back to his senses. So now how... How is this a messianic psalm? Well, just in the parts that we're looking at today, uh, there are three obvious connections to the Messiah. And specific, specifically to the crucifixion of the Messiah. First, we find in verse 16, it says, For dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircles me, They have pierced my hands and feet. And then secondly, in verse 18, it says, They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. But third is probably the one that we looked at in verse 1. Jesus himself, is quote. he quotes this verse on the cross. He said, My God... My God, why have you forsaken me? We find that in Matthew chapter 27. Why would he do that? It's not a coincidence that Jesus quotes the exact phrase from Psalm 22. I believe it's because he was drawing attention to this psalm of both anguish and joy. As if to say, there's a new dawn about to break. There's a new morning. There's a new sunrise on its way. Just as David was delivered by God and rescued from death and destruction, God's ultimate deliverance for all mankind from eternal death was carried out by Jesus. He did so on the cross. So Psalm 23 is beloved and it's often quoted. When we as sheep, we need the comfort and the protection and the safety of our shepherd. I often am asked to quote And to read from Psalm 23 when I officiate funerals. When I make hospital visits, people often ask me, Pastor, would you read Psalm 23 for me? It's when we need comfort from our our shepherd. But Psalm 22 was also a beloved psalm 
For it was a reminder to God's people that there would come a deliverer. And that song was set to the tune of the doe of the dawn. It was a reminder that a new day was coming. That a new morning was breaking. And in quoting the beloved uh, Psalm 22's opening line, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus is in effect saying, The darkness of sin no longer has a hold of you. I have come to deliver you. Morning has broken. Let's pray. God, we thank you that long before, centuries before, Jesus would hang on the cross. These words would be written down. To give people a a glimmer of, of hope that you, Yahweh, you are the deliverer. And that we so often are so caught up in you delivering us from maybe sometimes it's big things and sometimes it's little things, but just they're all earthly things. But you came to deliver us from eternal death and separation from you. That's why you came. That's why you hung on the cross. That's that's why you were born on this earth. So that you can become the deliverer to save us from eternal sin and eternal separation. From the Father. Lord, thank you that this Christmas season we get to celebrate your birth. We know that Christmas is not your birthday. In fact, we don't really know the proper date on the calendar. But thank you, Lord, that we get to have a season where we celebrate your birth. That we get to refocus ourselves, our eyes, our minds, our hearts back on you. And the reason you came. Lord, let that be a lesson for us this season. As we give gifts to one another. Let us not forget the greatest gift that was ever given to mankind. It's the gift of salvation. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for giving, providing a way for us. And thank you, Lord, that even in our darkest hour, in our darkest time of need, we can always Anticipate that new morning breaking. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let me invite you to stand together and um, we'll sing our doxology.
Well, beloved, how's this for repetition? God loves you. So go love people. God bless you. You're dismissed. We'll have a little reception out on the lawn. And so look forward to seeing you there. Have a great week.